So my name is uh, Niamh Maloney. I'm uh, a financial markets regulatory specialist um, in LSE Law, but I'm also uh, the head of department. So I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's event. It's great to see such a, such a great turnout. Um, this workshop on crypto assets and the law. I understand, and I'm very pleased to know you're looking at the foundational legal issues in this area with two extremely distinguished uh, commentators. Professor Angela Walsh, who we're absolutely delighted to welcome, a leading expert in this area from St. Mary's University School of Law, San Antonio, Texas. And Professor Walsh, we can't unfortunately claim you. I know you're visiting UCL's uh, centre in this area, but we're so glad you're with us today. Thank you so much. And her co-organiser for today's event is Dr. Edmund Schuster, one of my colleagues in the LSE Law Department. Uh, Edmund is just a powerhouse in, in, in the whole corporate financial area. He runs our big law and economics workshop, regularly organizes seminars, and as many of you will know, he's doing some very, very interesting uh, work in this area. And later on, or very shortly, you'll be meeting uh, Dr. Adrian McHaler, again, one of our big experts in corporate and financial regulation. We recently shared a panel on what does it mean, what does the notion of money mean, mm -hmm. and intermediation and uh, technology in this area. So. Some very big questions here. I mean, for my part, we've uh, a very long tradition um, in LSE law of asking big questions and, and kind of challenging the obvious and, and deconstructing issues. And my sense is in this area, this is the question of the hour. You know, these huge questions about technology, crypto assets, distributed ledgers, blockchain, uh, and, and how, how to engage with them, how to grapple with them, and how we use long standing tools like the law uh, to understand them. Now I know it's a hugely diverse and very vibrant group of experts from academics to technologists to writers to practitioners, a huge uh, variety of, of views in the room. Um, so I won't hold up the discussion anymore. Um, I wish you a very productive afternoon. I think the papers, the participants, the interlocutors, the commentators mean this will be a very, very um, interesting uh, debate. So I think I'm handing over to Professor Walsh, chaired by uh, Dr. McHaler, discussing deconstructing decentralization exploring a core claim of crypto assets. So have a very good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Okay, so, hi. It is great to be here with you guys today. I am so excited that people actually came to this because Edmund and I just kind of what if we do this? And um, it's just, I'm thrilled because I know there are some really, really expert people in the room here. And I'm presenting a new work in progress. Um, I'm just still working through the ideas. So I will very much value your feedback, your questions, your ideas, your challenges um, as we go uh, through this today. So, um, I'm not in London very long, so I'm grateful to get uh, to be with you. I'm actually based in Texas, in San Antonio, so this cool weather just feels really, really good. Um, so my title today, Deconstructing Decentralization, um, Exploring the Core Claim of Crypto Assets. Okay, so um, my project is pretty much what it sounds. Um, this concept of decentralization is um, everywhere when you talk about crypto assets or blockchain technology, distributed ledgers, right? The entire premise, um, if you're viewing this as I do as a record keeping system, the premise is that it's a group record keeping system. Instead of having uh, one party do it, instead of delegating record keeping to one party, you are having it done by a group of people, okay? So I see this as group record keeping. Okay, so um, today we're going to kind of reflect on what that means, that group idea means today, and this idea of decentralization. Where, is, where do I point here? Do you know? I can also just click here as well. Now it should work. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is what we will talk about today. Okay. So First of all, why is decentralization relevant to the law now? Right? This is a crypto assets and the law workshop, so I'm going to talk about why it's relevant. And I have a sneaking suspicion that most of you now know about why it's relevant. Okay? Then I will talk a little bit about how do we figure out what decentralized means? Okay? Where are we getting our meanings from? 
um, what might be the possibilities, can we pin it down? I'm going to talk about um, what I see actually um, the, the term being used for, um, that the, the meanings that are kind of hiding behind the term. And I see decentralization as being um, a claim about power in a system and where power lies, um, and that power is um, dispersed in a meaningful way here that may affect our notions of who is acting as agents in the system, where should responsibility and accountability lie. I think this has some um, very interesting, significant implications for law um, if we are thinking about decentralization as a concept that um, should, should trigger legal consequences in different ways. Um, and I'll talk about that and then I'll offer some closing thoughts. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, why is decentralization relevant to the law? Well, it's because of what the SEC said earlier this summer. Uh, Commissioner Hinman, uh, in a speech on June 14th, um, a speech that was very avidly watched by the crypto community, because I watched it on Twitter, um, a, talked about how Ethereum, in its current form, it doesn't think is a security. And the SEC used a lot of language about decentralization in this speech. Now, of course, it's important to note that this is just a speech. It is not anything that has any binding effect or anything. But I guess we like to read tea leaves. and it's to, So that's what I'm going to do today, is try to uh, put some meaning to this, because it looks like, to me, that they are um, putting some, you know, quite a bit of weight on this concept of decentralization. So, um, if the network on which the token or coin is to function is sufficiently decentralized, where purchasers would no longer reasonably expect a person or group to carry out essential managerial or entrepreneurial efforts, the assets may not represent an investment contract. And then, down here, where the efforts of a third party are no longer a key factor for determining the enterprise's success, material information asymmetries receive. As a network becomes truly decentralized, the ability to identify an issuer or promoter to make the requisite disclosures becomes difficult and less meaningful. Okay? It comes up a few more times here. Right? So Hinman tells us, when I look at Bitcoin today, I don't see a central third party whose efforts are a key determining factor in the enterprise. The network on which Bitcoin functions is operational and appears to have been decentralized for some time, perhaps from inception. Okay? Comments on Ethereum here. Based on my understanding of the present state of Ether, the Ethereum network and its decentralized structure, right? This is where he tells us current sales and offers, current offers and sales of Ether are not securities transactions. And then thinking about other possible networks, over time there may be other sufficiently decentralized networks and systems. So, extremely relevant, coming from the SEC now. And um, my first reaction to this was, well, what are they meaning? And, um, you know, are, do we think these networks are actually decentralized? What are we meaning by that? And there were, um, you may notice me referring to Twitter quite a lot because um, I know a lot of you from Twitter, and um, that's where a lot of discussion in the crypto world happens if you're not on it. So, lots of reactions from people who are experts in the space. Um, some of them, uh, you know, if the SEC is using this for, you know, a legal, a legal meaning here, maybe we should figure out what it means, right? A lot of people had this kind of same reaction. Okay, so how do we know what decentralization or uh, being decentralized means? Well, um, just like we see here today, because we have people from different disciplines here, right? Um, we know that in the cryptocurrency space, the crypto asset space, we have lots of different fields coming together. So um, where might the meanings come from? They could come from a lot of different places when we're thinking about what decentralized means. Okay? Could they come from the law? Has the law grappled with this concept before? Uh, well, we're talking about how groups work here. Does political theory potentially have some ideas for us about what it means for a group to be decentralized? And of course, you know, bringing the computer science, ideas about distributed systems or network theory potentially um, have ideas about what it means for um, what, what a decentralized uh, system might be, okay? How are we using it in the space, okay? Um, 
I have some ideas about how I see people using this terminology. Sometimes they, they seem to be using it um, to refer to the peer-to-peer -peer network and having a lot of nodes, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of miners or there's a whole bunch of nodes in the system and that's what we're talking about when we say it's decentralized. Um, it, it seems to be used also to, um, to, to uh, su support uh, different claims <coughs> that these systems make about themselves, right? That they are extremely resilient, right? That they um, create uh, permanent immutable records, right? And uh, how would the decentralization <coughs> contribute to that? Well, it's kind of one of the magic ingredients, it seems to be, um, that you, you put together in these blockchain systems to, to kick out these awesome characteristics, right? Yeah. So if you, um, if you have a decentralized system, that means it's resilient one, for one reason, because if your record's sitting on a whole bunch of different nodes, you'd have to knock all of them out except for, and including the last one, in order to really get rid of it, right? So it's, it's said to be uh, robust, resilient for that reason. Um, if you have a lot of um, decentralized nodes in the network, it'd be very hard to um, to change the record because you'd have to have a certain amount of computing power to do so. It's hard to overcome everybody. So I think it's used in one sense about um, for uh, to to uh, support the claim that it, this is a resilient system. I think it's also used um, and uh, this is the concept I'm going to focus on. Um, I think it's also used to make claims about where power lies within the system, okay? Um, I, I think that uh, when people say it's decentralized, they're kind of uh, fuzzying up who is doing things, okay? It's a decentralized system, and we see that term being used for public blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the rest, and we see it being made about private blockchains as well, okay? They're all decentralized, and somehow that gets rid of the power in the system. All right, well, what does the SEC think about this, right? They're the ones who first have used it in a, um, a, a legal sense or approaching a legal sense, so what do they think? Well, I think they're focusing on this idea of what the network looks like, and I, they, the language that they're using means that they are having trouble, it appears to me, finding <coughs> these central people who are doing things, who are exercising agency and power. And I'll show you uh, why I think that. Okay, so here I think they give us some hints about um, what they mean. So first of all, let's look at the yellow, okay? They use the term network every time when they're talking about decentralization. As the network becomes truly decentralized in the first one here, the network on which Bitcoin functions is operational and appears to have been decentralized. The Ethereum network and its decentralized structure, other sufficiently decentralized networks. Okay, so that to me suggests that they are focusing on the, uh, the nodes, the miners, but doing the validation here. We're thinking about, you know, how many are they? How, um, how widespread are they? Are they distributed around the world? Um, how much mining power does, uh, does each of them uh, have, right? It's thinking about the computer network is what that suggests to me. Okay, looking at the green, okay, you see, I think, this um, kind of acknowledgement that they, they can't find people doing things in these systems, okay? The ability to identify an issuer or promoter becomes difficult in the first one. I do not see a central third party whose efforts are a key determining factor in the enterprise. Okay. Um, this one down here, uh, there, uh, there will continue to be systems that rely on central actors whose efforts are key to success of the enterprise, okay? so. In their securities analysis here, right, one of the factors of this Howey test is that you're relying on the efforts of others, right, to, um, for, for your um, uh, potential investment <laughs> return, right? So, of, of course, you're, they're trying to find here people who are, um, who you might be relying on. And they're saying they can't find these people in the system. So it looks to me like they're saying, okay, well, we're going to make our decentralization analysis based on what the network looks like because we can't see other people. Okay, so I don't, I don't think that's a complete analysis here that the SEC is necessarily doing. And of course, it's not really fair to um, criticize them for this. That wasn't, it was a speech. It wasn't intended to be a complete analysis. But 
um, I, I do think it's, it's worth talking about here. Okay, so um, as I said, I see this term decentralization, um, this conscious, uh, concept of something being sufficiently decentralized as about um, power within the system. Okay, and if we think something is sufficiently decentralized, it says to me that we think that power is spread out among a whole bunch of people, different players, and because it's so spread out, you know, no one's really doing anything that we can point to. And maybe, right, they're talking about, I can't find this, okay? So maybe if we can't find the people to point to who are doing things because power is so amorphous within the system, then, you know, at least from a securities law perspective, how could we give them responsibility to do things? How could they be an issuer here who had disclosure responsibilities, for instance? Um, how could we pin anyone with accountability because we can't find them in these systems, okay? Um, I'm skeptical of that uh, point of view, okay? Um, a lot of my work previously has been trying to look through these systems and see where people are actually making what I consider to be meaningful decisions that impact others. So um, where should we be looking here? Uh, what are we potentially not seeing, okay? If the SEC is focusing on these networks, counting nodes, counting miners, uh, what are they missing, okay? Uh, these systems have um, several groups that are involved in operating them, right? We certainly have nodes and miners, but we also have software developers, and some of you may today, here today may be software developers in these systems. Um, we have these two groups that are certainly important in keeping these systems going, right? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the idea that maybe these systems aren't as decentralized um, as the SEC thinks, um, but also just to kind of grapple with these ideas of, well, how do we measure decentralization here, okay? So thinking about mining, right? Uh, one of the reasons that I was surprised to see this conclusion about based on the current state of ether, it's sufficiently decentralized that it's not a security. One of the reasons I was surprised there was because of the research that I have uh, seen about the concentration of the mining pools in Ethereum and how many there actually are that hold a significant um, percentage of the hashing power within the network, right? Um, I will be conservative here because I can't remember the exact number at the moment, but you know, say it's four to five mining pools that control the, uh, that have, uh, I think 51% of the network or, or more. Bitcoin, uh, a similar idea, um, significant portions of hashing power in a small number of mining pools, okay? <coughs> How does that factor into an idea of decentralization, okay? Are people making decisions that potentially impact what happens if miners are the ones who, um, you know, have to adopt software and run it to process the transactions, okay? Um, one of the <clears throat> I'm still working through this and would value your input on this point. One of the comments that I um, have gotten previously about why I'm, I'm missing something about that the concentration of mining pools is not relevant because they're, they're pools and the, you know people who are directing their computing power to them can easily move to another so that it's not meaningful to even look at mining pools. I would welcome uh, discussion of that because I want to try and understand it better. Okay, this, the second group that I think the SEC is just leaving out of the equation here are the software developers, okay? Um, they didn't mention anyone here. They didn't suggest that there was anyone else involved in these systems. Well, um, I've gotten a lot of heat previously for suggesting that um, certain software developers within public blockchains, cryptocurrencies function as fiduciaries. So you can imagine that I think that software developers are kind of important in these systems and they are making decisions that um, are necessary to keep these systems running. Right? They don't just start them and, and, okay, off and running, we're done here. Right? There are continual changes to the systems. There are always updates. There are decisions made about new features, policy decisions that are implemented in software code. Okay? So um, I think certainly um, you need to be thinking about who are the core developers who make the ultimate decision about what ends up in a new release. Okay? Um, and there are likely others who... Um, help to shape this. I'm using the concept, the idea of software developers in a broad sense, not just the people who maybe actively write the code, but the broader group who helps shape the policy decisions as well that, um, that end up implemented in it. Okay, so maybe we're missing some things here that we need to take into account in the idea of decentralization. 
Okay, I also think we need to um, acknowledge and grapple with this idea that decentralization, the, the decentralization level of a system is something that's moving. Okay, it is never static, right? There are software developers coming in and out of these systems. Um, the, the, the core developers, um, people move in and out of those roles. There have been some prominent departures that we've seen over time in both, uh, in, in both Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example. Um, the, the, dis, the centralization levels in the mining networks and the node networks certainly shift constantly, right? Um, and you may become more decentralized sometimes and less decentralized sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so what do we do with that? If we're thinking of it as a legal concept, right? Um, Ethereum, they say right now, is sufficiently decentralized so it's not a security. Okay, does that mean it's always not a security or does that mean if it becomes more, um, more centralized then it goes back over that threshold line, right? Can, once you get over, are you there for good or can you fall backwards? Uh, so it's very much a moving target um, and I, I think we need to think about what that means. Um, I also think it's um, important um, to transition our thinking um, about decentralization in these systems to one that acknowledges that it's something on a spectrum rather than a binary, um, a binary issue. Um, so <clears throat> um, there is no absolute claim of decentralization and there is, I guess, unless you have one person doing it, maybe that's an absolute claim of, of centralization, right? But um, systems exist on a spectrum and the, um, the, the recent report from the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance uh, makes this point about decentralization that I think is a good one. Okay, so I think with decentralization, we're thinking about where is power within these systems, and we need to look hard for it. Okay, so I think uh, this idea about decentralization has implications for law, okay? Um, and I think that just because we're getting this idea first in the securities law area does not mean that that's the only area of law that this is relevant to. And I'll explain what I mean now. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> this is where we're going to get really big and broad and just think about, well, what does law do for us? Well, in one sense, law is just about trying to identify where power is and to either channel that power in a particular way or constrain it, right? Um, it's trying to find where people are acting with agency and figure out, are we okay with that, right? Law is about shaping behavior, okay? And, and people are, are the ones whose behavior we're looking at shaping. Okay, if we're thinking, um, as, as I, I think, when we're talking about the idea of something being sufficiently decentralized, we're acting as if, um, well, the power is so diffuse and dispersed in this network that we can't find the agents, okay? We, we, we can't find them, so maybe there is no agency here. Maybe people aren't making active decisions here that law can apply to, okay? Um, maybe we have to leave them alone because if we can't find them, how can we use law to shape their behavior, okay? And um, this would be a big deal if we're deciding that this concept of decentralization here means that these people are kind of, uh, people involved in these systems and that the system shaped a certain way means that they're kind of off limits law. So this is why I see this as broader than just having securities law implications. Um, so. Uh, right, it came up in the securities law context, but if if we're if this idea is used in other contexts, it would have real implications, right? Um, something that is, if you're uh, sufficiently decentralized, um, maybe that is what makes us think that these are commodities, that they're things wrapped in a box, right? That then we can build other financial products on, right? Because you're just trading these digital assets that are neat and cannot that are not fluid, that cannot be manipulated, they are things, okay? I think a lot of that relies on our beliefs that these are sufficiently decentralized, power is diffuse, no one can come in and change them. I'm not sure that that's true, um, especially with this idea of like forks and 51% um, <clears throat> attacks and stuff. I think these are much more fluid than we would expect assets be generally little boxes and commodities, okay? So I think that has implications there. 
Um, as I've already kind of hinted at, right, I think this has the broader implications if we're seeing crypto assets as uh, potentially the base of a lot of different financial products, okay? If they are a base asset and one of our um, assumptions and beliefs, core beliefs about that system, this there's no power there, so they're a thing, and we can put them in ETFs, we can put them in futures, we can build all kinds of complex financial structures around them, right? Do we have a core misunderstanding at the base that's going to then influence everything we build on it? Finally, I think it may have some implications here for companies' law or just the law around entities. So if we're saying that something is sufficiently decentralized that you can't find the people in it, uh, well, are we kind of giving those people a liability shield for what they're doing, right? Think about what company law is for, right? Corporate law, LLCs, right? You, um, you form, you, you work in a group and you form a, uh, a particular legal structure that enables you as a person to be protected from liability. The company, right, can still be sued, right? Um, but this seems to be, five minutes, okay. This seems to be um, maybe even more protective than a corporate veil would be, right? A corporate veil, protects the people, but not the company. They put the company on the hook. If we're saying that something is sufficiently decentralized, we don't have a company there to put on the hook, and we're saying that power is diffused among the people so we can't get at the individuals either. So um, this is, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but that seems to be really uh, protective. Um, finally, as I've already hinted at here, how will the law uh, treat the fluidity of decentralization status, right? Um, do we have to measure it periodically if it's changing all the time? Um, where's the threshold of what is meaningfully decentralized, sufficiently decentralized? Okay, finally, I'm just going to close here with a few reflections, okay? If decentralization is now relevant as a legal category, as the SEC has suggested, but then I think we have to figure out what it means. And pretty quick, if they're actually making decisions about whether something is a security based on this idea. There are many different potential sources of meaning, right, from lots of different fields because lots of different fields intersect here. Um, I think the SEC um, seems to be using it as a code for um, no powers here. No humans are acting here. They're not exercising power, so we can't, we can't find them to pin law to. But I'm not sure that they're right. I think they're just missing some um, exercises of power and judgment. Okay, if this is the case and we're using decentralized, sufficiently, sufficiently decentralized in the way that I'm talking about here that the SEC has used it, right, as this kind of uh, veil, then that may have really big implications for law. If we're going to apply the same idea across different fields, I think it can have um, a lot of implications. Are we potentially here, if we're saying you have a veil of decentralization, Right? Are we making new entities law here kind of um, in a roundabout way? Right? You can call your group of people doing things decentralized and not have to file for you know, becoming a corporation or something. Well, why wouldn't you do that, I guess? Um, and finally, I do think that we need to think about the broader implications of this, not just for securities law, but particularly in light of the fact that um, we're viewing crypto assets as base assets that can be financialized um, lots of big implications. So that is where I will wrap up, and I would love feedback, ideas, criticism, hate mail, all of that kind of stuff. So <laughs> thank you very much.